Hello everyone, welcome back to Chapter A Day. Uh, we are kind of making our way rather slowly through the very good sized classic uh, Little Women by Louise May Alcott. Uh, we are getting ready to start Chapter 9 today. Chapter 9 is called Meg Goes to Vanity Fair. We've had a, a number of chapters that are focusing on each one of the girls and the 10th began to focus on what their um, character flaws are. So um, I think we're about ready to learn some more about Meg. So, um, chapter nine, Meg goes to Vanity Fair. I do think it was the most fortunate thing in the world that those children should have the measles just now, said Meg, one April day, as she stood packing the go a broadie trunk in her room, surrounded by her sisters. And so nice of Annie Moffat not to forget her promise. A whole fortnight of fun will be regularly splendid, replied Jo, looking like a windmill as she folded skirts with her long arms. And such lovely weather, I'm so glad of that, added Beth, tidily sorting neck and hair ribbons in her best box, lent for the great occasion. I wish I was going to have a fine time and wear all these nice things, said Amy, with her mouth full of pins, as she artistically replenished her sister's cushion. I wish you were all going, but as you can't, I shall keep my adventures to tell you when I come back. It, I'm sure it's the least I can do. When you've been so kind, lending me things and helping me get ready, said Meg, glancing round the room at the very simple outfit, which seemed nearly perfect in their eyes. What did Mother give you out of the treasure box? asked Amy, who had not been present at the opening of a certain cedar chest, in which Mrs. March kept a few relics of, plat of past splendor, as gifts for her girls when the proper time came. A pair of violet stockings or a pair of, of silk stockings, that pretty carved fan, and a lovely blue sash. I wanted the violet silk, but there isn't time to make it over, so I must be contented with my old Tarleton. It'll look nicely with my new muslin skirt, and the sash will set it off beautifully. I wish I hadn't smashed my coral bracelet, for you might have had it, replied Joe, who loved to give and lend, but whose possessions were usually too dilapidated to be of much use. There is a lovely old-fashioned pearl set in the treasure box, but Mother said real flowers were the prettiest ornament for a young girl, and Lori promised to send me all I want, replied Meg. Now let me see. There's my new gray walking suit. Just curl up the feather in my hat, Beth. Then my poplin for Sunday and the small party. It looks heavy for spring, doesn't it? The violet silk would be so nice. Oh, dear. Never mind. You've got the Tarleton for the big party, and you always look like an angel in white, said, Nick, said Amy, brooding over the little store of finery in which her soul delighted. It isn't low-necked, and it don't sweep enough, but it'll have to do. My blue house dress looks so well turned and freshly trimmed that I feel as if I got a new one. My silk sack isn't a bit the fashion, and my bonnet doesn't look like Sally's. I didn't like to say anything, but I was dreadfully disappointed in my umbrella. I told Mother Black with a white handle, but she forgot. She bought a green one with an ugly yellowish handle. It's strong and neat, so I ought not to complain, but I know I shall feel ashamed of it besides Aunt, beside Annie's silk one with a gold top, sighed Meg, surveying the little umbrella with great disfavor. Change it, advised Jo. I won't be so silly or hurt Marmy's feelings when she took so much pains to get me things. It's a nonsensical notion of mine, and I'm not going to give up, give up to it. My silk stockings and two pairs of spandy gloves are my comfort. You are a dear to lend me yours, Joe. I feel so rich and sort of elegant with two new pairs and the old ones cleaned up for common. And Meg took a refreshing peep at her glove box. Annie Moffat has blue and pink bows on her nightcaps. Would you put some on mine? she asked as Beth brought up a pile of snowy muslins fresh from, Anna, from Hannah's hands. No, I wouldn't, for the smart caps won't match the plain gowns without any trimming on them. Poor folks shouldn't rig, said Joe decidedly. I wonder if I shall ever be happy enough to have real lace on my clothes and bows on my caps, said Meg impatiently. You said the other day that you'd be perfectly happy if you could only go to Annie Moffat's, observed Beth in her quiet way. So I did. Well, I am happy and I won't fret, but it does seem as if the more one gets, the more one wants, don't it? 
there now. The trays are ready and everything in but my ball dress, which I shall leave for Mother, said Meg, cheering up, as she glanced from the half-filled trunk to the many times pressed and mended white tarleton, which she called her ball dress with an important air. The next day was fine and Meg departed in style for a fortnight of novelty and pleasure. Mrs. March had consented to the visit rather reluctantly, fearing that Margaret might come back more discontented than she went. But she had begged so hard, and Sally had promised to take good care of her, and a little pleasure seemed so delightful after a winter of hard work that the mother yielded, and the daughter went to take her first taste of fashionable life. The Moffats were very fashionable, and simple Meg was rather daunted. At first, but the, the splendor of the house and the elegance of its occupants, but they were kindly people in spite of the frivolous life they led, and soon they put their guest at her ease. Perhaps Meg felt, without understanding why, that they were not particularly cultivated or intelligent people, and that all their gilding could not quite conceal the ordinary material of which they were made. It certainly was agreeable to fare sumptuously, drive in a fine carriage, wear her best frock every day, and do nothing but enjoy herself. It suited her exactly, and soon she began to imitate the manners and conversation of those about her, to put on little airs and graces, and use French phrases, crimp her hair, take in her new dresses, and talk about the fashions as well as she could. The more she saw of Annie Moffat's pretty things, the more she envied her, and sighed to be rich. Home now looked bare and dismal as she thought of it. Work grew harder than ever, and she felt that she was a very destitute and much injured girl, in spite of the new gloves and silk stockings. She had not much time for repining, however, for the three young girls were busily employed in having a good time. They shopped, walked, rode, and called all day, went to theaters and operas, or frolicked at home in the evenings. For Annie had many friends and knew how to entertain them. Her older sisters were very fine young ladies, and one was engaged, which was extremely interesting and romantic, Meg thought. Mr. Moffat was a fat, jolly old gentleman who knew her father, and Mrs. Moffat a fat, jolly old lady who took as great a fancy to Meg as her daughter had done. Everyone petted her, and Daisy, as they called her, was in a fair way to have her head turned. When the evening for the small party came, she found that the poplin wouldn't do at all, for the other girls were putting on thin dresses and making themselves very fine indeed. So out came the Tarleton, looking older, limper, and shabbier than ever, beside Sally's crisp new one. Meg saw the girls glance at it and then at one another, and her cheeks began to burn, for with all her gentleness she was very proud. No one said a word about it, but Sally offered to do her hair and Annie to tie her sash, and Belle, the engaged sister, praised her white arms. But in their kindness Meg saw only pity for her poverty, and her heart felt very heavy as she stood by herself, while the others laughed and chattered, prinked and flew about like gauzy butterflies. The hard, bitter feelings were getting pretty bad when the maid brought in a box of flowers. Before she could speak, Annie had the cover off, and all were exclaiming at the lovely roses, heath, and ferns within. It's for Belle, of course. George always sends her some, but these are altogether ravishing, cried Annie with a great sniff. They are for Miss March, the man said. And here's a note put in the maid, holding it to Meg. "'What fun! Who are they from? Didn't know you had a lover!' said, cried the girls, fluttering about Meg in a high state of curiosity and surprise. "'The note is from Mother, and the flowers from Laurie,' said Meg, simply, yet much gratified that he had not forgotten her. "'Oh, indeed,' said Annie, with a funny look, as Meg slipped the note into her pocket as a sort of talisman against envy, vanity, and false pride. For the few loving words had done her good, and the flowers cheered her up by their beauty. Feeling almost happy again, she laid by a few ferns and roses for herself, 
and quickly made up the rest in dainty bouquets for the breasts, hair, or skirts of her friends, offering them so prettily that Clara, the elder sister, told her she was the sweetest little thing she ever saw, and they looked quite charmed with her small attention. Somehow the kind act finished her despondency, and when all the rest went to show themselves to Mrs. Moffat, she saw a happy, bright, bright-eyed face in the mirror as she laid her ferns against her rippling hair and fastened the roses in the dress that didn't strike her as so very shabby now. She enjoyed herself very much that evening, for she danced to her heart's content, everyone was very kind, and she had three compliments. Annie made her sing, and someone said she had a remarkably fine voice. Major Lincoln asked who the fresh little girl with the beautiful eyes was, and Mr. Moffat insisted on dancing with her, because she didn't dawdle but had some spring in her, as he gracefully expressed it. So altogether, she had a very nice time, till she overheard a bit of conversation, which disturbed her extremely. She was sitting just inside the conservatory, waiting for her partner to bring her an ice, when she heard a voice ask on the other side of the flowery wall, How old is he? Sixteen or seventeen, I should say, replied another voice. It would be a grand thing for one of those girls, wouldn't it? Sally says they're very intimate now, and the old man quite dotes on them. Mrs. M. has laid her plans, I dare say, and will play her cards well, early as it is. The girl evidently doesn't think of it yet, said Mrs. Moffat. She told that fib about her mamma as if she, as if she did know, and colored up when the, when the flowers came quite prettily. Poor thing, she'd be so nice if she was only got up in style. Do you think she'd be offended if we offered to lend her a dress for Thursday? Asked another voice. She's proud, but I don't believe she'd mind, for that dowdy Tarleton is all she's got. She may tear it tonight, and that would be a good excuse for offering a decent one. We'll see. I shall ask that Lawrence as a compliment to her, and we'll have fun about it afterward. Here Meg's partner appeared, to find her looking much flushed and rather agitated. She was proud, and her pride was useful just then, for it helped her hide her mortification, mortification, anger, and disgust at what she had just heard. For innocent and unsuspicious as she was, she could not help understanding the gossip of her friends. She tried to forget it, but could not, and kept repeating to herself, Mrs. M has her plans, that fib about her mama, and dowdy Tarleton, till she was ready to cry and rush home to her to tell her troubles and ask for advice. As that was impossible, she did her best to seem gay, and being rather excited, she succeeded so well that no one dreamed what an effort she was making. She was very glad when it was all over, and she was quiet in her bed, where she could think and wonder and fume till her head ached, and her hot cheeks were cooled by a few natural tears. Those foolish yet well-meant words had opened a new world to Meg, and much disturbed the peace of the old one, in which till now she had lived as happily as a child. Her innocent friendship with Laurie was spoilt by the silly speeches she had overheard. Her faith in her mother was a little shaken by the worldly plans attributed to her by Mrs. Moffat, who judged others by herself, and the sensible resolution to be contented with the simple wardrobe which suited a poor man's daughter was weakened by the unnecessary pity of girls who thought a shabby dress one of greatest calamities under heaven. And that, my friends, is where we will leave off to today. for today. Tomorrow we will catch up and find out how she solves her little conundrum. So thank you so much for joining me, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow.